So I just finished up a couple of amazing battle tech battles. And now we're going to jump back 300 years or so. Chain of command, World War II. Now you guys know that across all wargaming systems, I love tanks. I love armor. And in Chain of Command, playing my Germans, I usually play Panzer IIs, Panzer Threes, because for the support choices, the support points that you use to spend on tanks and additional units outside of the infantry that you start with, I like to have a variety of toys. I like to have some additional machine gun teams, maybe a mortar team, flamethrower team. To play the heavy tanks, they are very, very, very expensive. We're talking about, you know, 8, 10, 11 points, support points to throw one tank down on the table. That's a lot. But the allure is just just too much. And I had completed a couple of Tiger ones. I've got two King Tiger tanks and I've got a Hunting Tiger tank, the most powerful tank in the game, late war 1945. So that's what we're playing. That's what I'm going to leverage in this game. My Germans versus the British. We'll see how we're going to do. So my thoughts going in. Right now what we're looking at is a kind of flyover of the terrain. Because this is the first difference um, when you that I find in playing Chain of Command. I also enjoy playing Battletech, Wings of Glory, Warhammer 40,000, um, other historical or ancient games. But the dynamics of, of Chain of Command, I don't want to say stressful, but very intense. As in... When I finish playing a Battletech game, I'm pumped, I'm ready to go, let's let's go out, let's get something to eat, let's kind of talk about what happened. I'm ready for more. Chain of Command, I'm like, I'm mentally I'm spent. I need a nap. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow morning or in a couple of hours here. It, it is that intense because the way the game works is we're looking, and it's a historical game, so we're looking at essentially Fortress Europe. I'm trying to stop the, the Allied invaders, so we have a lot of... Uh, farm fields, hedgerows, trees, bushes, buildings. There's a lot of places to hide. There's a lot of places to ambush. There's a lot of places to move and and get cover. It's vastly different than Warhammer 40,000 or Battletech, where you could have very intense uh, terrain-heavy games, but for the most part, the terrain is more dispersed. The second unique challenge, and this is kind of feeding into this, this super powerful tank, is how the game mechanics work in terms of deployment. You put down jump-off points, and, and there's a phase where you kind of maneuver and, and vie for position. These markers, these jump-off points, represent potential places where your troops can be. If you think about uh, other war games, you put out your toys, I put out my toys, we both know where each other, where they are. Chain of command, you roll command dice, and you can deploy stuff all of a sudden and in different points. You don't know where it's going to deploy. So my concern in playing this tank was, I'm not worried about uh, a British Churchill tank or an American Sherman, even if it's a Firefly variant, because this is not Fury. My Germans actually hit stuff. My Germans actually blow stuff up. And I have a, what, 16 dice anti-tank armor piercing shell. That is going to shred any tank that appears. But what I am worried about is a hidden anti-tank gun. Sitting in one of those hedgerows or, or two anti-tank guns with a, a senior officer or a spotter that if my tank starts moving down that road, it appears it could smoke me. I have the heavy armor, but if it, if it gets a good shot and it rolls well and I don't roll that great for my defense dice, the armor, even though it's heavy armor, it could take out my tank. Now, the other kind of interesting thing about Chain of Command is the units, in terms of a rule set, the units behave like regular units. I know a lot of you guys follow Warhammer 40,000, so it's a great example, contrast between the two. I take a Land Raider. In Warhammer 40,000, a Land Raider is, is, a, is the most powerful tank in the Imperium. It is just tons and tons of ceramite steel and LAS guns and variants. Uh, you know, machine spirit guiding it as high tech as can be in the game. You take that vehicle, you send it up on a hill, you have full control over your unit until it is destroyed. So if there's like uh, three other tanks on there and a Titan, which is a giant uh, war machine, and I run that Land Raider up there, it's going to do that until it gets blown up. You have full control over your units. Chain of command, they're just men. 
not only the infantry, but in those tanks, even if they are dedicated soldiers, even if they are committed to NC, they, they are just men. So what you see in the game, so what you see in the game is as a, as a commander, I'm spending command dice moving my tank up. If it gets hit, even if it's not destroyed, it's going to put shock on the tank. There's men in there getting hit by anti-tank guns. They don't know where that, that those shots are coming. They might pull back. They might respond in, in a way and, and kind of move and protect themselves. If the tank gets immobilized, they might bail out. Your tank gets immobilized, it gets taken out, catches on fire, the crew is going to bail out. So there are a lot of ways to lose your stuff without it getting destroyed. And the further challenge of chain of command, uh, likewise, when your infantry start uh, taking losses, they take shock, they get pinned. You're, as a commander, you're in like five or six places trying to keep morale up, trying to keep um, your forces moving and, and dealing with, with shock and pinning and breaking and, and command dice. It is very, very tactical. So my concern is, even though I'm virtually untouchable on, this, on the table, if I do get immobilized or I get ambushed and my, my crew abandons the tank, that's 11 support points in there. We'll see what we can do. So my plan was, looking at the table, I'm going to leverage this tank. I'm going to move the tank up along the road. Uh, you start on the road. I can go off-road, but if I go off-road with a heavy tank, I could get stuck. I could get permanently immobilized. Then I'm really, really easy to hit because there's no movement modifiers, and I'm in trouble. So I'm going to move on the road. I'm going to push up to the farmhouse. I'm going to park that tank in front of the, harm, uh, the farmhouse. And I'm going to fire away at whatever I can. I'm going to put my jump off points, uh, one in the orchard behind the farmhouse, one to the south in the forest, so this way I can pr protect my flanks. I'm going to bring my infantry up on the left. I'm going to bring up my infantry through the, the orchard into the back of the farmhouse. I'm going to take that farmhouse. I'm going to use the hard cover. I'm going to use the elevation. I'm going to park my MG42s in there. We're going to just fire back at the British. And then once I've inflicted enough losses, in theory, and I've brought the British command dice down a little bit, we're going to drive them off the table. I'm going to win that scenario. Then I'm going to link up with the rest of the heavy tank battalion. We're going to get great elevation, and we're just going to shell those American convoys and those American tanks with our, our you know hunting tiger tanks and other dedicated uh, tank killer tank hunter units. That's the plan. I bring the tank up. I deploy an infantry unit in the apple orchard. So far, so good. British appear behind one of the walls on the side of the farm. They've got a great vantage point. They've got hard cover behind that stone wall. I knew they were going to deploy there. I didn't think that soon. They get the jump with the command dice shooting on my infantry squad. I've got light cover in the apple orchard, but it's not dense enough to block line of sight, uh, unlike the other forests and how they work, I kind of fire back, things stall down, stall out. On the other side of the table, I know it's there somewhere, I can't see it, uh, a British mortar team is dropping smoke. This is one of the army rules in chain of command where the British have access to smoke rounds. So they start concealing parts of the battlefield, uh, dropping smoke in front of my advancing tank, so this way it cuts down on its field of fire takes me two or three turns and a couple of command dice to get that tank into position. I finally got it lined up. I open up with the high explosive shells. I start laying down the machine gun. It's, it's just beast. I mean, the British just start disintegrating on there. But somehow, despite the shock and despite the kills and the junior officer getting wounded or, or taking a loss, getting killed, uh, they hold. They're not going anywhere. Plus, they're returning machine gun fire on my infantry squad. So I'm kind of stalled out. Now, while this was happening, this was, was taking a couple of turns. I had hoped to already be into that farmhouse and, and getting kind of ready to go. Uh, two other British infantry squads were now making, one of them was making their way south through the forest. And the other one was kind of pushing on the opposite side of the farmhouse to maybe take it. I don't, I don't know what, but to definitely do something there. But they were... They were moving up into position. Okay, we got to get this tank back in play. So I pivot it. It's a slow-moving tank. Just to turn 45 or 90 degrees takes a dice. It's slow going. I start to get that pushing up back. I deploy another squad out in the, in the apple orchard to kind of reinforce. 
At this point, a British squad had made it into the forest to the south. It is sitting on my jump off point. So now I can't the jump off point there. I now can't deploy out. Based on the rules for chain of command, they're hidden in the forest. I know they're there. I can see the models, but I, I can't shoot at them unless they advance within four inches of the forest edge. They're there. I, I got to do something about them. But what? I'm not going to go into that forest. And if they get a good run, if they get a double run or they get some decent command ice, they could pour out of that forest and, and get the jump on me and lay down some, some fire. I'm not going to bring the tank back. I already wasted a couple of turns figuring out, do I go to the left? Do I go to the right? I knew the tank moved slow. I didn't quite realize how slow it moved. This was the first game um, playing with the tank. So a, a couple of light mistakes, a couple of light mistakes there. But I finally get it in front of that, that farmhouse. And I start laying down some high explosive rounds on the British infantry kind of advancing. It stalls their advance. They jump behind a hedgerow. And now the anti-tank gun appears. Perfect position. Uh, just within one of the hedgerows, kind of the tree line out in the field there. Junior officer issuing commands. My tank is parked. It's slow. It's big. You can't miss it. Two rounds bounce off. So I'm like, yeah, that, that armor is doing what it has to do. But I'm looking at the dice we're rolling, and it is a threat. It is a threat. I mean, I don't want to be... Uh, shooting rounds back and forth at each other, even though I'm probably going to win, I, I don't want this anti-tank gun to get lucky. And it's harder to kill the anti-tank gun because the gun shield and, and the crew, it's it's a smaller target. It's it's dug in with cover versus, say, a tank. So while I have the advantage in, in attacking dice, there's a couple of advantages it has, even though absolutely it's, it's weaker against the tank. But I don't want to be trading rounds back and forth on there. So we're going to push ahead. We're going to move. I then take a hit. And this is where the chain of command rules come in. It hits. It bypasses some of my armor. doesn't damage the tank, but it puts some shock on my crew. So they kind of react. They panic a little bit. They reverse six inches. They go smashing into the um, farmhouse. Now, it's good I didn't have any infantry in there because then the building might collapse. My infantry would take damage. They'd get run over by the tank. It would just be a disaster on there. So that burns a turn. I now deploy out my last infantry unit behind the orchard. They run up to the side of the house on there. They've got a senior officer in there issuing commands. And now I've got my tank shooting at the anti-tank gun. I've got the anti-tank gun shooting at my tank. I've got a infantry, uh, British infantry squad that I'd like to be shooting at with the tank, but I can't, exchanging fire back and forth with my advancing infantry. They're on the side of the farmhouse, but they're out in the open. I try to get up there. I take some losses. I wind up getting pushed back. I wasn't quite ready to risk them because as you take losses, you lose command dice. There's less stuff you can do. If you have less and less dice, you start at about five. And as you take losses, it goes down to four, three, and each D6 activates a unit. I need to have the maximum availability of command dice. I need to be activating that tank every single turn. So we're, we're just pushing. I finally say, okay, this is it. I got, you know, the mistake I made with this tank was it was so many points, 11 support points. It is so beast. It is so overpowering. It's king of the jungle, right? And why am I worried about it getting destroyed? Why am I like moving to the left, to the right? Why am I, I mean, yes, I'm concerned. I'm cautious, but I'm allowing the British to capitalize on my hesitation. I got to take that tank, send it up to that jump off point, roll over that infantry. If it gets taken out, it gets taken out. But I need to make this tank a British problem. I need to keep them occupied dealing with the tank. So it, it allows um, breathing room for the rest of my infantry to, to kind of do something on there. So we go over the hedge wall. I get immobilized. Makes sense. It's slow. It's tons and tons of steel and metal. It's, it's kind of digging into the countryside. I lose two turns of movement just trying to get off there. I lose two turns of, of shooting, just trying to get off there. There is a chance I will become immobilized, but I risk that chance. I finally break free, and now I'm moving across that field. The anti-tank gun gets a couple of more shots off, doesn't penetrate my armor. The British, now I've got, I've got my momentum back. I'm pushing forward. Down in the south, where that forest is, British machine gun team breaks off. They're 
from the, the main infantry group. They're trying to get a side shot. If they get up there, so I'm pinned by the first infantry group. It's kind of the stalemate. I don't want to move. They don't want to move. The machine gun team is moving up to the side where they will be able to maybe snipe my senior officer or they will be able to shoot down the, the wall that I'm hidden behind. So something has to happen here, right? Something has to go on. I get a double run of command dice, which means I get to go twice. Now, if you've been following my blog or YouTube channel and, and had a chance to game with me, you know my two, everyone has a wargaming personality. Not just with the, the armies they play, not just with the things that they do, but, but just how are you reflected on the tabletop? And the two things of my personality are, my philosophy is, big guns never tire. And that's reflected in this uh, hunting tiger tank. You can have your fancy tactics. You can have your units. You could have your math hammer, your theory hammer. That's all going to disintegrate against big guns. So I always bring the big guns. Uh, the counter to that, the foil to that, the riposte to that is it assumes that I can utilize it correctly. I was not utilizing the tank that well this game. But with that, we're going to push. My second thing is when we get to that point in wargaming, my second personality is I love the assault. I love close combat. I love martial honor. I guess that's just um, real-life martial arts discipline kind of bleeding over into me. It's part of my personality. I can't escape it. It's, it's a part of me after all these years. So if I can settle things in the assault, regardless of the time period, I will. That's why for Warhammer 40,000, I've got Cornet Berserkers, bolt pistols, chain swords. That's why in Battletech, I'm running up there. I'm trying to punch and drop kick you in death from above. Chain of command... If we have to, we will charge. I believe when in doubt, if you don't know what to do, if you're not that sure, charge. When in doubt, charge. Because that momentum is going to force your opponent to do something. It's going to force them to reveal their plans. And they might not be quite ready in terms of timing to reveal that. So I'll regain that timing. Plus there's the chance for massive, massive gains with a sudden surprise charge. And third, even if it fails okay, there's martial glory and honor to, to win in that. So from my mind, it's like big guns, charge equals win-win, or at the worst, a loss, but we had a lot of fun doing it. So I give the command, go over the wall, ready those hand grenades, ready the pistols, take out that machine gun team, charge it, then we're not stopping, then we're running into that forest, and we're going to take the British that are in there. It's brutal. My, my junior officer gets killed. My senior officer takes a wound. I takes a couple of losses on uh, the members in the squad, but we flush the British out of that. They're just, they're not ready. They, they weren't ready for, for the German charge. We, we just route them from the forest. This brings my command dice down, but it brings the British command dice down. So now it's really just this tank and the tank is laying on the hurt to the, to the anti-tank gun. I'm putting on lots of shock. Uh, eventually it breaks. And I've got my other two infantry squads ready to move up, ready to take what remains of the house because the tank flattened it when it backed into it. And the tank is going to just push forward and the British don't have the momentum. They don't have the command dice and the game ends there with a win for the Germans. And I'm like, Phew. this, this was close to the end. Even with the superiority of this, this monstrous tank, I, I need like a, I need a nap. I need a couple of hours here to, um, to regroup. So analyzing the game, looking at it, the tank was beast, but the British being nimble and not trying to counter the tank by throwing down another tank, even a dedicated heavy tank, I would have shredded it. Uh, they made some great choices in there. You, you did take the gun because if you had the chance to hit side armor and take out my treads or get rear armor, that stood a good chance of taking it out. Um, even deploying that anti-tank gun, while it couldn't reliably pierce my armor, it was somewhat of a threat, so it forced me to engage it. So that means I couldn't bring high explosive or machine guns uh, against the infantry. And with the slowness of the tank, even with my infantry trying to support it, uh, the British were able to move past it. They were able to kind of move left and right and, and move around on it. They were able to bypass it. And by ambushing me early in the beginning of the game... And keeping my infantry over in the orchard pinned, effectively tied down, because I'm not going to advance out into the open, that, that really stalled my advance. That really, that 
more than anything, I think, dictated the flow of the game because it prevented me from getting up to that, that farmhouse, that hardened structure, that elevated structure from the beginning. But it was that charge. It was the big guns, and it was the charge that, in my opinion, carried the day and won the game.